The scene opens with an agent in a coat and hat navigating a hallway, carrying two briefcases. As he descends a staircase underneath the building, he discovers a concealed time bomb. Swiftly, he opens one of his briefcases, revealing a gadget, and starts disarming the bomb with precision. Unexpectedly, another person appears, interrupting the agent's task. The agent responds by drawing his gun, searching for the intruder. Suddenly, the enemy strikes, landing a shot on the agent, causing a brief exchange of gunfire. With the bomb ticking, the agent prioritizes containing it within the gadget. But before he can secure it, the bomb detonates, causing severe burns and throwing him back. In agony, the injured agent struggles to reach for his other case. Surprisingly, the intruder aids the burned agent in reaching the case. After a moment's pause, the intruder walks away, leaving the agent behind. Despite the explosion, the agent inputs something into the case and enters it. Following the incident, the injured agent recuperates in a hospital bed, wrapped in bandages. His superiors commend his efforts but advise him to let go of the failed mission and focus on recovery, as he's gearing up for a final assignment. The elusive criminal he was pursuing, known as the Fizzle Bomber, plans a catastrophic attack in 1975 New York, causing mass casualties. Determined to thwart the Fizzle Bomber's plot, despite instructions to move on, the agent sets his sights on stopping this criminal once and for all. After a period of rest, the doctor removes the bandages, assuring the agent of his significant recovery. However, the doctor warns that his face and voice will be markedly altered due to the injuries. Facing his transformed appearance in the mirror, the agent acknowledges and accepts his scarred yet different visage. Seven years pass, and the agent's face has completely healed. He grabs his voice recorder and begins documenting his experiences, expressing that he's on the verge of embarking on his final mission. He emphasizes the mission's significance and how it will bring them closer to their ultimate destination. As the agent gets ready, his superiors furnish him with weapons and reiterate the rules, cautioning that any deviation from the mission will result in a lethal injection. The agent agrees, receiving the earlier case from them. Once all arrangements are complete, he sets off for his ultimate assignment. Inside a city bar during the late hours, the agent assumes the role of an undercover bartender, seemingly awaiting someone's arrival. A figure cloaked in a coat and hat enters the bar and promptly orders a drink. The bartender discreetly engages in conversation while serving the individual. They briefly discuss the fizzle bomber before shifting to another topic. The newcomer discloses himself as a writer, an unwed mother, crafting confessional tales for a living. The bartender is aware of the writer's work and shows one of the magazines he reads. Surprised that a bartender not fitting the typical reader profile is familiar with his content, the writer dismisses the worth of his own writings. The bartender admits occasionally turning to these magazines for insights into a woman's viewpoint and is intrigued by a man knowing it. The writer reveals that he was once a girl, leaving the bartender astonished. However, before delving deeper into the matter, the writer begins narrating his life story. It all commenced on September 13, 1945, when he entered this world, abandoned and left at the doorstep of an orphanage. The orphanage took him in and bestowed upon him the name Jane. Growing up, Jane harbored a fascination with outer space, yearning for the parental care that other children seemed to possess. Perplexed about why his parents deserted him, Jane grappled with feelings of unworthiness, pondering if he was at fault for their abandonment. As time passed, Jane sensed a distinctness within. More self-aware and inquisitive than the other girls at the orphanage, Jane made a solemn vow to offer her future children a genuine family, unlike her own upbringing. Thus, she diverted her focus to learning combat skills, surpassing even the boys in strength and excelling as the brightest in her class. Jane adored mathematics and science, effortlessly mastering these subjects. However, her peers found her odd, leading Jane to resent herself for being different, recognizing that her uniqueness made adoption highly improbable. Resigned to the notion that she would never be someone's daughter or wife, Jane neared graduation when she encountered Mr. Robertson. He sought young women like Jane for a government job in an organization called Space Corp, centered on space exploration. Robertson explained that they were scouting for females excelling in mathematics and science, with robust physical prowess. Jane eagerly accepted the offer and applied. During her interview, she conveyed her determination, impressing the panel and securing her place. Space Corp conducted rigorous training sessions to assess the volunteers' suitability for space travel. They subjected Jane and others to advanced visual simulations of space. While Jane felt invigorated and thrilled by the prospect, some volunteers struggled to cope. Endurance and written tests posed challenges for many, yet Jane excelled effortlessly. Moreover, interviews with a heartbeat-sensing device uncovered Jane's contemplations about love and her uneasy relationship with fellow volunteers. In a scuffle with one volunteer, Jane emerged victorious through adept parries and forceful punches, prompting staff intervention and subsequent medical examination. Outside, a doctor handed Robertson a report outlining something unique about Jane's physiology. The doctor discreetly disclosed to Robertson 
that a particular aspect of Jane's condition would disqualify her. But Robertson, intent on protecting Jane, instructed the doctor not to inform her and assured he'd handle it. Consequently, Jane found herself disqualified without understanding the reason. While gathering her belongings, Robertson approached her, and Jane explained that she merely defended herself. Assuring Jane of his efforts to reinstate her, Robertson's promises left her skeptical, prompting her to seek alternative means of livelihood. She toiled as a household aide during the day, serving a modest family by managing their chores. During her leisure time, Jane discovered confession story magazines, becoming engrossed in reading them. In the evenings, Jane attended etiquette classes but struggled to adapt. It was during this time that Jane encountered the man who would transform her life. On a rainy night, a chance encounter led Jane to collide with a man. After apologizing, Jane inquired if he was lost, to which he replied, stating he awaited someone. Reciting a quote, Jane was astounded when the man completed the saying, remarking on their shared thoughts. Jane shared with the bartender her admiration for the man's looks and affluence, falling for his demeanor. Mockingly, the bartender seemed aware of the impending outcome. Jane questioned if the bartender had ever acted foolishly for love, to which he confessed a single instance, empathizing with Jane's sentiments. Continuing her narrative, Jane expressed that being with the man marked her happiest period, although it abruptly ended when he asked her to wait on a bench, never returning. Realizing it was a fleeting affair, Jane swiftly moved on, nurturing hopes of rejoining Space Corp. Robertson visited her one day, divulging that the organization was not dedicated to space travel, but rather a covert government agency using Space Corps to identify exceptional individuals devoid of family or past connections, like Jane. Jane admitted she didn't comprehend the job's significance, but sensed it would alter her life positively until she discovered her pregnancy and Robertson vanished without a trace. The man, aside from leaving Jane with a shattered heart, left her with an unexpected future. Alone among other expectant mothers in a charity ward, Jane felt isolated. One night, she found herself in intense pain on an operating table, attended by nurses and doctors prepared for the delivery. After the operation, a doctor approached Jane, gleefully announcing the successful cesarean and the birth of a healthy baby girl. However, the mood shifted when the doctor began questioning Jane about her body's condition, as if uncovering something significant. Jane, bewildered, informed the doctor that she hadn't received any prior information and believed everything was normal. The doctor disclosed to her a startling revelation. She possessed both male and female reproductive organs, with the underdeveloped female organs enabling her to carry a baby. Due to severe postnatal bleeding, a hysterectomy was performed to remove her female reproductive parts, yet successful reconstruction allowed her male organs to function, requiring further surgeries. Overwhelmed by this news, Jane was tearful and struggled to accept the situation. Despite the doctor's assurances, she found it challenging to come to terms with the events. She continued to care devotedly for her baby daughter, regarding her as the best thing in her life. When asked about the baby's name, Jane wished to name her after herself, determined to raise her daughter well. Tragically, the baby was abducted from the hospital nursery by an older man. Despite Jane's exhaustive efforts, neither her baby nor the kidnapper was ever found. Alongside this immense loss, Jane underwent three significant operations and spent 11 grueling months in the hospital, transitioning physically into a man. These experiences shattered her sense of self. After the transformation, gazing at the mirror only reminded Jane of the past that had ravaged her life. Despite fervent attempts, re-enlisting in Space Corps proved futile. They were aware of her story, deeming her unsuitable for space travel, dashing her hopes for that future. Consequently, Jane changed her name and relocated to New York to rebuild her life. Striving to make ends meet, Jane eventually found work as the unmarried mother, writing confession stories for a living. She concluded her story there. In an unexpected turn, the bartender asked Jane a haunting question. If given the chance, would she kill the man responsible? Jane admitted without hesitation that she would indeed do so. This was Jane's poignant and tumultuous life story, shaped by heartbreak, loss, physical transformation, and an unwavering desire for justice. The bartender, insistent on helping Jane, reveals he knows the person responsible and can compel him to act. Initially mistrustful, Jane, under her current identity as John, remains skeptical. However, when the bartender divulges her true name, it catches John off guard and piques her curiosity. The bartender discloses that he works for Robertson, finally convincing John to follow along. Descending to the cellar, the bartender reveals a case, claiming it's a time machine, insisting they'll journey back in time. Still wary, John hesitates until the bartender, actually an agent, stands close and instructs her to hold the case, close her eyes, and stay still. In an instant, they vanish from the cellar, transported to Cleveland, Ohio in 1963. Disoriented by the time travel, John gradually regains composure. The agent equips John with cash, clothes, and the mission details, hinting that the man who ruined her life might be the infamous Fizzle Bomber. 
Assuring John that killing this man could secure her desired job, the agent leaves John to carry out the mission. On the crucial rainy night, disguised as part of the plan, John navigates to the designated spot where the man is to encounter his past self. Accidentally bumping into a girl, John diverts attention, claiming to wait for someone. The girl recites a familiar quote, triggering a revelation in John's mind. He's the man they've been pursuing all along. As he turns around, he meets Jane, and he's struck by her beauty. Expressing heartfelt admiration, John compliments Jane, who smiles in response, acknowledging his kind words. Unbeknownst to them, the agent watches from a distance and discreetly departs, refocusing on his own failed mission. However, this time, the agent spots the fizzle bomber setting up the bomb. Despite the bomber evading the initial shot, a brief gunfight ensues before the bomber flees the scene. The agent pursues the bomber, finding himself in a dim section of the basement. Despite a cautious search, the bomber ambushes him, engaging in a brief scuffle. With a powerful blow to the face, the bomber knocks down the agent. As gunshots echo, the agent, spurred by the familiar sound, rises and rushes to the bomb. There, he encounters his past self at the moment of his facial disfigurement. Sympathetic, the agent aids his former self in accessing the field kit, sharing a poignant glance before the former agent time travels away. Acknowledging his failure, the agent retrieves a part of the bomb, taking it with him as he departs through time. Arriving in 1964, consumed by anger, the agent reflects, plans, and records his mission. Meanwhile, in 1963, John and Jane share a coffee outing. Jane admits her lack of affability, and John candidly elucidates the reason. Surprised by their similar outlooks of feeling superior, Jane questions what makes John feel superior, to which he whimsically claims the ability to read minds. Prompted by Jane's curiosity, John begins recounting truths about her life, struggles, and thoughts on love. Initially in denial, Jane gradually falls for John as he sympathizes with her experiences, forming a deep connection. Their conversation evolves, leading to an intimate moment between them. Back in the hospital hallway, the agent encounters Robertson. Presenting a piece of the bomb, the agent acknowledges making an unauthorized jump. Surprisingly, Robertson tolerates this, advocating for flexibility among agents to save more lives. Expressing hesitation about the next task, the agent worries about inflicting pain on Jane. Robertson elucidates the mission's importance, preserving an agent generated by a predestination paradox, someone devoid of lineage or history, akin to John. Assuring the agent of the righteousness of his actions, Robertson departs, leaving the agent to grapple with the weight of his mission. The nurse exits the ward, allowing the agent to take Jane's baby. Preparing the infant for time travel, the agent inputs the date, September 13, 1945, and carefully transports the baby back to the orphanage doorstep where Jane's story began. Wishing the baby well, the agent addresses her by both names, John and Jane, before calling the orphanage to report the abandoned child, completing the cycle. Returning to Cleveland, Ohio, 1963, the agent notices John and Jane at a distance. John, spotting the agent, instructs Jane to wait as he approaches the agent, gun drawn, feeling deeply deceived. Despite John's anger, the agent asserts the inevitability of events. John reveals his genuine love for Jane, a sentiment acknowledged by the agent. Providing clarity, the agent elucidates Jane's past, present, and their interconnected roles. Stunned by the revelations, John grapples with understanding. The agent reassures John, affirming the correctness of the unfolding events. Reluctant but resigned, John gazes at Jane one last time before accepting what needs to occur. Guiding John to headquarters, the agent assures him of a better life ahead. Following an exhausting time jump, nurses attend to John's recovery. Meanwhile, the agent confers with Robertson outside. Robertson elucidates that John must endure a full life to become the person capable of preventing future crimes. Despite lingering concerns about the fizzle bomber, Robertson reveals the bomber's inadvertent assistance in fortifying the agency, surprising the agent. Handing over a timer and new leads on the bomber, Robertson instructs the agent that after reaching the final destination, the field kit will decommission according to regulations. Acknowledging this, the agent and Robertson bid each other farewell, marking the end of their shared journey. The agent, leaving behind recorded messages for John, embarks on his final jump to New York in 1975, anticipating the decommissioning of his kit. However, the kit fails to deactivate. Discovering instructions from Robertson to continue pursuing the fizzle bomber, the agent locates a typewriter in an antique store. Acquiring the typewriter, the agent, actually John all along, starts penning a novel, a revealing account of his entire life. Upon completing the novel, John realizes crucial connections and shocking realizations about the fizzle bomber. Armed with this knowledge, he picks up a gun and heads out. Entering a laundromat, John confronts an older version of himself, the fizzle bomber. Disheartened by what he's become, the bomber justifies his actions as preventing deaths by sacrificing a few lives. However, John bitterly highlights the lives destroyed by the bomber's actions, vowing never to succumb to his fate. 
The bomber claims it's predestined for John to become him, stating that killing him will perpetuate the cycle. Proposing an unconventional solution, the bomber insists that only by loving him again can the paradox be broken. Disregarding this plea, John coldly shoots and kills the bomber, cementing his fate. Everything aligns, a cyclical paradox interweaving the baby, young Jane, adult John, the unmarried mother, the enigmatic lover, and the agent, all facets of the same predestined individual. As the newly recruited agent John turns the page in his preordained life, the time for decommissioned John to execute his next predestined move approaches. The paradox persists, continuing in an unending loop.